Welcome to a lesson on undamped mass spring systems. While we did say we will usually only look at first order systems, it is sometimes more convenient to study the system in the way it arises naturally. For example, suppose we have three masses connected by springs between two walls, as pictured below. We could pick any higher number, and the math would be essentially the same, but for simplicity, we pick three right now. Let us also assume no friction, that is, the system is undamped. The masses are M1, M2, and M3, and the spring constants are K1, K2, K3, and K4. Let X1 be the displacement from rest position for the first mass, and X2 and X3 the displacement of the second and third mass. We make, as usual, positive values go right. As X1 grows, the first mass is moving right. This simple system turns up in unexpected places. For example, our world usually consists of many small particles of matter interacting together. When we try the system above with many more masses, we obtain a good approximation to how an elastic material behaves. By somehow taking a limit of the number of masses going to infinity, we obtain the continuous one-dimensional wave equation, which we'll look at in section 4.7. And now back to our problem. Let us set up the equations for the three mass system. By Hooke's law, the force acting on the mass equals the spring compression times the spring constant. By Newton's second law, force is mass times acceleration. So if we sum the forces acting on each mass, put the right sign in front of each term, depending on the direction in which it is acting, and set this equal to mass times acceleration, we end up with a desired system of equations shown below. Let's go through each equation. For the first equation on the left, we have m1 times x1 double prime, which is mass times acceleration, which is equal to on the right, we have negative k1 times x1, plus k2 times the difference of x2 and x1. Notice as mass one moves to the right, there are two forces acting on the mass, spring one and spring two. As mass one moves to the right, notice spring one is stretched, and therefore the force is to the left, giving us a negative force. This is why we have negative k1 times x1. We have the spring constant k1 times x1, which is the displacement of mass one, which is the same as the amount spring one is stretched. And then it's negative because again, the force is to the left. And as mass one moves to the right, notice spring one is compressed, and therefore the force is gonna to be to the right, giving us a positive force, given by the spring constant K2 times the spring compression, given by the difference of X2 and X1. And now for the second equation, we have M2 times X2 double prime, which again is mass and acceleration, equals on the right, the right side is similar to the right side of the first equation. As mass two moves to the right, spring two is stretched, and therefore the force is gonna to be to the left, giving us a negative force, given by negative K2, where K2 is a spring constant, times the amount of string stretch, given by the difference of X2 and X1. As mass two moves to the right, spring three is compressed, giving a force to the right, given by K3, times the amount of spring compression, given by the difference of X3 and X2. Third equation is a little bit different. First we have M3 times X3 double prime, which is mass times acceleration. As mass three moves to the right, notice spring three is stretched, and therefore it'll pull back, giving a force to the left, given by negative K3 times the difference of X2 and X3. But looking at spring four, as mass three moves to the right, it is compressed, but because there's a wall to the right, it is going to provide a force to the left, giving a negative force, given by negative k4 times x3. For the next step, on the right, we gather the x1, x2, and x3 terms, and now to write an equation, we let matrix M be a three by three matrix containing the coefficients of the second derivatives along the main diagonal. We have M1, M2, and M3 along the main diagonal for matrix M, and then matrix K contains the coefficients of x1, x2, and x3 in a three by three matrix. Now we write the equation as matrix M times X double prime equals K times X. At this point, we could introduce three new variables and write out a system of six first order equations. We claim our setup is easier to handle as a second order system. We call vector X a displacement vector, matrix M the mass matrix, and matrix K the stiffness matrix. As with a single equation, we want to divide both sides by M. This means we need to compute the inverse of matrix M the masses are all non-zero, and M is a diagonal matrix, so computing the inverse is easy. We simply take the reciprocal of the masses along the main diagonal, 
shown here on the right. You may want to pause the video and verify m times m inverse, and m inverse times m is equal to the three by three identity matrix. And now with our equation m times x double prime equals k times x, we multiply both sides by m inverse, and let matrix A equal M inverse times K, and therefore we can write the system as X double prime equals A times X. Many real world systems can be modeled by this equation. For simplicity, we will only talk about the given masses and springs problem. We try a solution in the form of X equals V times E to the power of alpha T. We compute that for this guess, X double prime is equal to alpha squared times V times E to the power of alpha T which requires a chain rule. We plug our guess into the equation and get the equation shown below, alpha squared times V times E to the alpha T equals A times V times E to the alpha T. Next, we divide both sides by E to the alpha T, giving us alpha squared times vector V equals A times vector V. Hence, if alpha squared is an eigenvalue of matrix A and vector V is a corresponding eigenvector, we have found a solution. In our example, and in other common applications, Matrix A has only real negative eigenvalues and possibly a zero eigenvalue. So we study only this case. When an eigenvalue lambda is negative, it means that alpha squared equals lambda is negative. Hence there is some real number omega such that negative omega squared equals lambda and therefore alpha equals plus or minus i omega. Recall the solution we guessed was x equals v times e to the power of alpha t Using alpha equals i omega, we have v times e to the power of i omega t. Applying Euler's formula, we have x equals v times the sum of cosine omega t and i sine omega t. By taking the real and imaginary parts, we find that vector v times cosine omega t and vector v times sine omega t are linearly independent solutions. If an eigenvalue is zero, it turns out that vector v and vector v times t are solutions, where vector v is an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue zero. This all, leads to the, this all leads to the following theorem we can use to write the general solutions to our second order systems in the form of x double prime equals a times x. Let a be a real n by n matrix with n distinct real negative or zero eigenvalues we denote by negative omega one squared is greater than negative omega two squared, and so on all the way down to greater than negative omega sub n squared, and corresponding eigenvectors, the vectors v1 through vn. If a is invertible, that is if omega one is greater than zero, then x of t is equal to the sum from i equals one to n of the vector v sub i times the sum of a sub i times cosine of omega sub i t, and b sub i times sine omega sub i t, is a general solution of x double prime equals a times x for some arbitrary constants a sub i and b sub i. If a has a zero eigenvalue, that is omega one equals zero, and all their eigenvalues are distinct and negative, then the general solution can be written using the formula shown below. Notice the only difference here is the beginning part where we have x of t equals vector v sub one times the sum of a sub one and b sub one t plus and this sum here is the same as the sum above, except now we start with i equals two. I hope you found this helpful.